Fantastic. Great. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So good to see all of you. I'm Aviva Weiss. I am the founder and the CEO of Fun and Function. I am thrilled to welcome you to our Sensory Room Conference today. I see you've already been introducing yourselves, but if you haven't, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat and please share your name, what you do, and where you're from. And we have, wow, we have people from all over. Hi, Heather OT from Pennsylvania. Jennifer, wow, it's coming in fast. Minneapolis, whoa. Uh, Dara from Connecticut. Wow, you guys are awesome. I can't read so fast. <laughs> Ellen OT from California, welcome. Wow. Hello, OT from Texas. Hey, Tammy from Colorado. Hello from Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania. I love Pennsylvania. Everything, every, everyone else is great, but Pennsylvania, go Pennsylvania. Lisa from Georgia, welcome. Welcome everybody. It's so wonderful to have you and it's so wonderful to see you. Uh, it's really fantastic. Hundreds of teachers and therapists and administrators are joining us today. And this tells you that sensory rooms are popular, but also stimulate a lot of questions. Fortunately, our expert team is here to guide you today and always. This conference is part of our Active Mind program. We work with schools across the country to improve classroom behavior and academic success. We're very, very passionate about each person's potential. Today, we'll focus on sensory room solutions. We'll show you how it works, why it's effective, and answer your questions all in an hour. Let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce you to my amazing colleague, Rifki Berger. Rifki is an occupational therapist with classroom experience in special education. She's everyone's favorite sensory coach. Rifki, take it away, and thank you all for joining. Hi, everyone, and welcome to your Sensory Room webinar, where we will learn how to take your Sensory Room to the next level. I'm Rifki Berger, OT, and I worked in product and education development, product education and product development for fun and function. I also work with our Sensory Room design team to create Sensory Rooms that will work for you and your students. A few instructions before we begin. Everyone, please set your chat to everyone so we can see your responses to all of our questions. For example, now let's take a moment to share in the chat what you are most interested in learning about today. Let's see, what are you interested in learning about? Okay, room setup, safety, new product, how to set it up, room, <laughs> safety, effective data collection, spacing, safety, sensory diets, room safety, effective use, developing something, data collection, routines, wow. We are going to get to a lot of these things today. And what we don't get to, you'll be able to ask our customer service team. And we are going to have you put questions in the Q&A section, which my colleague Eli Sheva is monitoring. And another OT on our team is gonna be answering some of those questions as they come in. But Eli Sheva will be picking one or two trending questions to answer during breaks that we take, okay? We'll also have some fun polls and you can share reactions with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And at the end, we'll share a survey link. All participants will be entered to win a $100 gift card. Okay. Getting started. Oh, hold on. Slide controls are not my friend today. Okay. Today, we're gonna to focus on how to create an effective sensory routine in any space. We're gonna hear now from Dr. Victor Keyes, the principal of the ABS West School. Our fun and function team designed their successful sensory room and we work closely with the school. Well, we have two populations of students. One population of students are those with autism. And we said so we wanna give those guys an opportunity to come in and feel and touch and experience you know, this room, this room was actually hand painted by uh, two individuals uh, during the pandemic. 
it's a lot of fun. They can come here if they feel kind of anxious. They can come here and sit down. They can relax. They can run. Uh, they can redirect their attention so they can you know, be prepared to learn in a few minutes. And it's all organized. When they come down here, the music therapist is in here. And I tell them, I say, I, I want these guys to come in and use a lot of the energy up initially. But then as we come down in the period and the session is over, we kind of slow them down and you know get their heart rates down so they can go into the classroom and be ready to learn. Well, we have two popular. Wonderful. Okay. So what are our learning outcomes for today, right? Our learning outcomes are going to be setting up effective schedules and routines, the implementing the best safety practices, like I saw so many of you mentioned. We're going to learn how to enhance our sensory space with versatile products that we already have. And we're going to learn how to apply different tracking, um, different sheets for tracking data and tracking behavior and data collection. I'm sorry. I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Goldie Gross, to start us off. Hi, I'm Goldie Grossman, Chief Strategy Officer here at Fun and Function. I was a former, I'm a former elementary school administrator, so I know the excitement and promise of bringing a fantastic opportunity like a sensory room to your school. I'm curious to know how many of you already had sensory rooms in your schools. So I'm gonna pop up a poll and if you could answer, that would be fantastic. I see a lot of you already have sensory rooms. I'm gonna give it another minute or so. Yeah, definitely the majority of you have sensory rooms. North of 80% of you have sensory spaces in your school. So you know the potential um, and I hope the rest of you get to see that potential really soon. The question that comes up once you have that sensory space in your school is what is it, you know, what does it take to run that sensory room during the really busy school day? I know a lot of you posted in the comments, you have dismissal soon, there's always a lot going on, new meetings. What does it take to keep that sensory room running? So we'll start with the schedule. Who's using this room? When are they using this room? And how are they even supposed to know when it's available? We'll show you a system for managing your sensory room that's easy and versatile. You'll need your system to be easy. Your teachers are busy. Your ther therapists are busy. You also need this system to be versatile because you have different students who have different needs and the schedule always changes. So let's take a look at this school schedule over here. What you're looking at is a magnetic board that shows 30 minute slots every day. Next, you think about the grades that are using. So over here, I have grades two to five and they're plugged in for different slots. Each grade is going to get two slots a week. Now let's think about our therapists. I'll call them Timothy and Sarah. Timothy's purple, Sarah's pink. And we added in slots for them to use the room where they can see students. Finally, in many schools, you have students who have an IEP and they're supposed to be getting extra time um, in the sensory space. So since I can't put their names on a schedule that would be posted publicly, um, we coded the orange magnets with, you know, for, to represent those students. Lastly, I have a few slots that are open. Those are my flexible slots. This is an easy system. It's doable, it's versatile, it works for a lot of schools. What I'm gonna ask you to do now is take a post-it or any writing, you know, any paper that you have handy. And I'm gonna ask you to think through three questions. You can kind of go ballpark with this. How many classes are using your room? How many therapists need access to your room? And how many students need extra time in your room? Again, let's think through, think through those three points. How many classes need the room? How many therapists need the room? And how many students need the room? If you have those three numbers down, congratulations, because you now have the start of your schedule. And if you're wondering how you're going to fill those open slots, to manage the open slots, you can just use a simple form like this. The teacher or therapist simply fills out the form, who will then send it to the board master who checks availability. Okay, we now know who's using the sensory space and when, but, the adults and the, the people in the room, both the adults and the children need to know how to safely use the space. I'm going to start with the adults. 
because the adults in the room do need training to use the room safely and effectively. What you're really looking for in a training is something that's going to cover the do's and don'ts listed here. We are going to send this handout to you um, after the webinar. When you think through the adults who will be using the room, those are the adults who would benefit from this training. And here's a bonus, you now have a topic for your next professional development day. This is all material that can be covered in a solid training. Um, let's start with safety. I wanna go into that a little bit more specifically because safety always comes first. I'm curious, I know 80% of you, more than 80% of you already have a sensory room. Um, I'm sure the rest of you may have other sensory equipment in your school. Post a safety rule that you have in regard to any sensory spaces in your school. Post it in the chat. Um, by the way, if you were to ask ChatGPT for a good safety rule for your sensory space, you would get good material, just not as expert as ours. Um, yes, I'm seeing the no, the no cell phone use. That's a pretty popular rule. Keep every, you know, because adult supervision is so key. Yes, a lot about adults. Okay, a work in progress. Um, we'll get to that. The last piece that I'll cover is the points that you should keep in mind uh, when you're developing your sensory, when you're developing the safety rules for your sensory space. Oh, yes, you have detailed information about how to use swings. Oh, interesting, you know, how to, that the space is not for highly escalated students. Supervision, supervision, supervision. Cleanup is so important for maintenance and to keep the room at its best. Okay. Okay, I want to get a little bit more specific over here, and I want to show you what it looks like. You want to inspect your equipment really carefully. This is a key piece. You see how that carabiner is just worn down? You're looking at your equipment carefully. You're feeling it. You're touching it. You're checking for wear and tear. Make sure that every swing or climbing equipment is really secure. You want to run your hands over the equipment to see that, you know, everything feels as it should. Read the safety guidelines that we provide with every piece of equipment. There's key information there, such as, you know, making sure to use a swivel when you're using a single point suspension swing. Um, thumbs up in the chat if you've, if you've been able to read the safety guidelines that come with your sensory room equipment. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. If you haven't read those safety guidelines, please do. We make them really readable safety first. If you don't have the guidelines for your product, you can look up the product on the website and our safety room safety guidelines are accessible and you can just print them off straight from our website and share them with anyone who needs them. Okay, some of you, you know, some of you mentioned that your safety points are, you know, your safety rules are still in development. If you want to take a minute to look through these, um, these points, a lot of them are kind of customizable to your space. For example, room capacity, right? That depends on the size of your room, how much equipment is in there. Um, you know, something like hygiene, you'll probably want to consult with your local department about what their expectations are, what their standards are. But these are all the points that you want to think through when you're developing the safety rules for your sensory space. Okay, let's pause here to take some questions. We'll turn to my colleague, Ellie Sheva Schreiber, who's our Director of Active Mind Solutions. She's been monitoring the questions. Um, Ellie Sheva, any questions? Hi, thank you, Goldie, and hello, everybody. So we have a few questions that have come in, and feel free to keep posting questions in the Q&A. Our first question today is like this. Do you recommend that schools post the schedules of the sensory room? I'm worried that students will be disappointed since our schedule sometimes changes without a lot of notice. For sure. So that's a great question. I do recommend that schools post that schedule somewhere where the therapists and teachers can easily see it. Um, at the same time, I wouldn't post it somewhere that students can see because, as you said, a change in routine can be hard for kids. So I post it somewhere like the main office or a staff lounge, again, somewhere accessible to teachers, but not to students. Thank you. Our next question is, what happens when a therapist's scheduled time for use of the room is right after the child's class had use of the room? Is there such a thing as too much sensory time for the child? Okay, that's also a great question. Um, when you look at that original board, I think any, any administrator who spent time with that schedule and moving things around and thinking about all the considerations, that's definitely a consideration I would, you know, I would take into account. If a therapist sees 
you know, let's say the students in the second grade, I'd make sure that that therapist and that second grade do not have back-to-back -back slots in the room. Okay. I noticed one of the slides mentioned medical clearance. Could you explain more of what you meant by that? For sure. Again, great question. Um, I'm not a medical professional. And you, what, 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 what's going on over here is that sometimes you have students with specific medical needs. I'll give you an example. Students with seizure disorders. And um, some of the equipment in the sensory room might be incompatible with their medical needs. Spinning, that rotational input, which should always be done only under close supervision from a therapist, is something that many children with seizure disorders can't tolerate. So if there's a student in your building with a medical history, the medical professionals in your building should make sure that they have medical clearance to use the sensory equipment. Fabulous. Does the knee matter sensory room versus sensory lab and why? So it's so interesting to me because every school has their own personality. Um, bring your personality to the name of the space. It does not matter at all. Okay. And one last question for this segment. How do you suggest using sensory rooms proactively and not reactively? Oftentimes we're seeing that sensory spaces could be used as a punishment or in or as a seclusion area, and we'd love to use it proactively, what would be suggestions for that? A hundred percent. We do recommend using sensory spaces proactively on a schedule. Um, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes some schools want to use it as a place for a student who's having a meltdown, but you really want to avoid that because you can find a student developing a behavior pattern where there's a meltdown and then that results in more sensory room space. So you really want to use that sensory room, you know, pretty much on a schedule in a proactive way. Um, you know, you might want to adjust the timing and, and a therapist or, you know, a sensory detective can definitely help you figure out the timing that's most effective for different students, different classes. But yes, proactive is definitely the recommended approach. Okay, thank you. So that's going to wrap up my questions for this segment. Everyone continue to post questions in the Q&A and we'll hopefully get to more of them after the next segment. Back to you, Goldie. Okay, so we've talked about how to schedule our time in the room and we've given an overview of how to use that sensory room safely. Now we want to actually use that sensory room with kids, help them be their best selves. So I'm going to turn it over to Rifty Berger. This is very much her area of expertise. Okay, thank you, Goldie. Before I start my segment, I just want to remind you, if you put your questions in the Q&A, one of our expert OTs can answer them. So I see a lot of you putting questions in the chat. Just try to put them in the Q&A instead. And um, a lot of you asked about, will there be a recording available? Yes, we're going to be sending out a recording, as well as some of the worksheets that you see here after the webinar. So stay tuned and look at your email. All right. We can all use sensory input to regulate, right? Everybody has a sensory profile. So let's all take a moment for a deep breath. In and out. Let's do that again. In and out. We can all feel how that breathing grounds us, right? Okay, now on your desk, is there a paper clip or an eraser or even a stress ball? Why don't you touch it for a moment and notice the sensations? Run it along your hands. Is what you're touching alerting or calming? Now, if you wanna put what you're touching in the chat and whether it's alerting or calming, we'll review some of your responses. Let's see, by the way, this sensory ball to me was very calming, but I had something else, um, this little touch screen thing that was very alerting, wow. Okay, a paper clip. So Mackenzie, did you find that alerting? Oh, you found it calming, okay. Excellent. Cold seltzer can be alerting. Yes. Okay. iPod case <laughs> alerting. Tough Velcro alerting. Paper clip alerting. Texture on pen alerting. Fuzzy blanket calming. Yes. Wonderful. We're using calm strips on our students' desk. It's amazing. We have something like that. An anemone kind of a spiky thing. Uh, spiky side of Velcro. Very alerting. Vanilla scented candle. I'm all for that. Therapeutic is alerting. Okay, therapeutic can be calming for some people. Oh, a warm mug for sure, calming. Wonderful. These are all responses that shows you how things can be calming or alerting. Now, let's look at what a sensory room can do for your students. Oop. 
Okay. So the sensory room has multiple things that can calm or stimulate you on all the senses. And an element of the good sensory room includes things that we can see, we can touch, we can hear, and maybe even smell. And there are some examples up here on your slide. But sensory rooms cater very much to the vestibular and proprioceptive senses. And these are the ones that act to alert you or calm you. The vestibular system is connected to the arousal level. And you can work it to be alerting or calming depending if you're moving fast and erratically like on a roller coaster or in a slow linear movement like a rocking chair. All right, so vestibular can be calming or alerting. Our system is the biggest go-to for sensory overwhelm. And you'll see a lot of items in your sensory room that address that overwhelm. It's akin to getting a big hug. Let's all do that. Put your shoulder, your hands on your shoulders and give yourself a big hug. And it allows for the release of dopamine. Ah, that feel hormone that allows you to calm an over aroused system. So let's keep that in mind, these arousal levels, when we go to the next slide. Okay, so we've got our little yellow guy. He looks happy, but our orange guy and our red guy are not doing so well. Okay, so we learn best when our nervous system is balanced. So if we are under aroused or over aroused, our ability to learn is compromised. Let's say your student Simone is looking out the window, ignoring instructions. We could give her a bounce board or a trampoline to get the optimal levels of arousal so she is ready to learn. You can also give her a wiggle cushion in class and that will help us learn. If your student Tom is agitated like this red guy and he looks like he's about to have a meltdown, he could use the calming input of sitting in a beanbag chair in the sensory room or in the corner of a classroom or some deep pressure with a foam roller. All right, so what are we going to do with all of this information? All right, we need to get the arousal levels right for everybody in the same sensory room. Okay, so let's figure that out. We can, we can compare our time in the sensory room to like a sandwich with many different layers. Okay, so when you enter the room, top of the bun, okay, organize everybody by reviewing the rules. There should be rules for the children and the staff posted. And we do have some of those resources on our website and review the rules with the student. Okay, that's that top section. And then you have them choose the tools and equipment. So in the middle section, you have your action. And those tools and equipment should help them give their best sensory input for their individual needs. Now, this can be done with a choice board or even by using an obstacle course where everybody is rotating through the equipment. Then at the bottom, you close with calming input so that the students are ready to return to class. And that's our sensory sandwich. Let's look at some of these alerting and calming activities that we can do. Okay, so there are many ways to wake up the body. Let's look at these activities and let me know that which ones you already use in your sensory space. Let's all share our ideas here and I'll read some of them off as they come in. Okay, we've got swing, trampoline, barrel, excellent. I love the climbing wall personally, a jumper. Is that on a swing? A ball, a trampoline, a tunnel, trampolines. Those are big for vestibular input, but trampolines I want you to know also give deep pressure input because you are activating the joints and the muscles. Oh, they're coming in here. Trampoline, bounce, spin and twist, balance board, sit and spin, roller track, punching bag, I love it. Hop and jump on decals on the floor. Yeah, you see that, the hop and jump. Okay, a bike, a bike's a good one. Okay. Wonderful, that's great. So now let's see one of the, some of the things that you can do to calm the system. So after we've done all the alerting in the middle of the sandwich, it's time to calm down the system. So at the end of the action the segment, you can dim the lights, speak calmly, soften the music if you're using music in your sensory room. Each child can be with their own favorite piece of calming equipment or you can come together for a few minutes of deep pressure. In fact, let's do some of that now. Bring your hands together in front of you and push, push, push through your palms. 
really push. Think of the word calm. Look at the word calm on the slide. <sighs> okay, great. Then you want to gather and talk about how the session made you feel. Okay, that's important to make it a therapeutic space as opposed to like a gym or outdoor recess. Then everybody can walk calmly back to class, ready to learn. Okay, so let's review the sandwich analogy again. We have two pieces of bread, okay, top and bottom with some action in the middle. But let's say your sandwich only has some lettuce and mayo. Well, that won't be much of a sandwich, would it? You need some deli and some tomatoes and maybe some onions. I like the onions to get the full meal. We need a sandwich that feeds our sensory system with varied and just right input, okay? So we can let the child have agency over what ingredients to put in their sandwich, like Kim might prefer pickles, but we have to guide them as to what constitutes dressing and condiments and what is the main ingredient. All right, everybody, let's pause and Elisheva will take some of your questions that came in. Thank you, Rifki. So we have a few more questions here. Let's start with the first one. We have a lot of students and not everyone can go to the sensory room regularly. How can you simulate some of the sensory input in the classroom? Okay, that's a great question. And you can always have a small corner of the classroom maybe marked out with some gel tiles, maybe with a bean bag and a bounce board. So we talked about the bounce board for learning and the bean bag chair with a weighted lap pad, let's say for calming. And you can have those things in your sensory room. We also have these amazing break boxes, which I'll show you a little bit later, that can be portable and be taken from space to space or kept in your classroom for the just right tools for when you need them. This way you won't have to be running to the sensory room for emergencies, like we mentioned, that's just reinforcing some negative behavior perhaps. Thank you. Here's a second question. Some of our faculty want a hybrid sensory room. Is that a better option than having separate rooms for calming and for energizing? Okay, so we love making hybrid rooms. We think that's the best solution because you've got your action section in there and then you have your calming section and all you've got to do is dim the lights and then you've got your sensory sandwich. If you already have an action room, then you can add some calming elements in a corner or along the edges and make yourself a hybrid room. And if you have a calming room, you might wanna add one or two things like a bounce board or um, one of those body socks, maybe even a stretchy swing. And you can have alerting things also in the calming room. But if you don't have that, don't worry. There are many ways to get to the sensory input. Okay, our space is too small to accommodate an entire class at one time. How can we best utilize our small room to meet the needs of more students? Okay, so you are asking about a small room and fitting in more students. Sometimes that's not an option because of safety. And you might want to rotate your students half and half. Let's say give some reading instruction while the rest of them are using the sensory room. So you have 10 to 15 students in the sensory space and 10 to 15 students getting reading instruction and you switch off. But I wouldn't recommend putting more students than is feasible into a sensory space. If it's like a must, you might wanna take out one or two pieces of equipment to give more space. But that depends on your amount and also the developmental level of your students you know, how well they're able to follow instructions of going through different things. An obstacle course is a great way to get kids through a sensory room safely, and they have to wait their turn. They also have to learn to wait. Okay. What is an appropriate amount of time for a student to spend in the sensory room? Okay. So it would be like as long as he needs, but that's not reasonable, right? So we usually recommend 20 to 30 minutes for a full sandwich, but you can also do a full sandwich in 10 minutes. It depends on that schedule board and how many classes you have and what the needs of your kids are. So scheduling is something that you're gonna have to figure out. It could be that one class needs it twice a week and another class needs it every day, depending on their specific needs. This is something that should be discussed in staff meetings, so that you can really work out a schedule that works to the benefit of all your children in all your classrooms. 
Okay. And do you feel an OT needs to provide direct supervision and presence in the room during its use? I would say that an adult needs to be present, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an OT. It has to be a responsible adult to make sure all the equipment is being used properly. I know that there are some districts who have one OT for every 500 students. So expecting an OT to be supervising a room is really not an option. Just make sure you have an adult that knows the rules and is responsible. Okay. What components could be considered a priority for a sensory room? For example, okay. do we need weighted deep pressure, balance, swinging? Like which, which pieces are the most critical to have? Okay. So we're going to discuss in the next segment how versatile your equipment can be, but make sure that you have elements for alerting and elements for calming. Okay. So if you have a swing hook, you can use that swing calmly, laterally, or you can use it in a more, you know, erratic kind of switching kinds of way. So the answer is make sure it's got proprioceptive and vestibular. And then we have like the condiments, the visual and the auditory and things like that. Thank you, Rifki. Okay, I'm gonna hand it back to you now. And we'll have a few more questions later on. Okie doke, keep them coming. Great questions, everyone. Okay, so now is a good time to talk about the equipment that you already have and how to use it. So one product can be used in many different ways to wake up or calm down the system. Okay, now this is a test to see how alert and awake everyone is. Which piece of equipment was on both the calm down and the wake up slides? Post it in the chat if you noticed what piece of equipment that was on both slides. Mm, it wasn't a swing, it was the barrel. The barrel was one where you, there was two different kinds of swings on both slides, but the barrel was the one that was the same in both the calming and alerting, okay? Some ingredients, let's see, our barrel. Okay, so some ingredients can be calming and alerting depending on how they are used. Rolling in the barrel will be alerting while rocking from side to side will be calming. And if one student is pushing the barrel, well, they're getting deep pressure input and the kid that's riding in the barrel will get that vestibular input. So that's an example of how one thing can be used for both vestibular alerting and calming. Okay, how many of you have gel floor tiles? We're gonna put up a poll. Everybody go to your poll. Okay. How many of you have gel tiles? Let's see. I was getting some thumbs up. Okay, all right. Oh, oh wow, answers are coming in. Okay, I am going to end the poll now and let's see our results. Okay, so we have got almost 50% of you have them in your sensory rooms, a quarter of just about a quarter have them in your classrooms, other places, I'd love to know what those other places are. And a little less than 40% of you do not have gel tiles. Okay, so let's talk about gel tiles and how wonderful they can be. Okay, so most of the places that have gel tiles, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, have them to mark out a sensory space, like this girl sitting in her squeezy seat, sitting on her gel tiles floor. But gel tiles can also be used to motivate movement. Over here, we've got a child jumping from one to the other, and you can also use that for color recognition. We have a child going down a hallway. Maybe you can use it for hopscotch, or you can just use it for calming visual input. Okay, I hope a lot of you get to explore gel tiles. I always recommend that you use the equipment that you're giving to the kids and really see how it makes you feel. Now, thumbs up. Okay, if you have therapy balls in your sensory room, I know that they're probably in every therapy room, but how about the sensory room? Oh, wow, we are getting a, a lot of thumbs up. Wonderful. Okay, so as you can see in the slide, there are many different ways to use a, sen a, a ball, a therapy ball, and some schools even use it in their classrooms for dynamic seating. And this helps keep kids awake and alert all day long, okay? Balls can be used for balancing, bouncing, and different dynamic postures that give vestibular input or deep pressure. 
You can also use it for strengthening through the hands, or you can roll it over the back of a child for calming deep pressure input. Okay, versatile, deep pressure, vestibular, deep pressure through the arms, all of those things. Now, there was somebody who asked a question about sensory in the classroom. How can you put sensory corners in the classroom? And this is, in addition to designing sensory rooms, we also offer break boxes that have portable tools. And you can use these tools to give sensory input in any space, like we mentioned. Okay, Elisheva, are there any questions that came in on the equipment and the versatility? Yes, we have some really great questions coming in. Before we start with the questions, I just want to mention a quick reminder to everybody that at the end of the presentation, we're going to be posting a very short survey after which you'll be entered to win a $100 gift card. So remember to fill in that survey. Okay, now back to these questions. Rifki, should we give students specific instructions for how to use tools for calming or alerting input or just let them use it as they want? Okay. So we don't wanna ever impose any kind of sensory input on a child. So it's good to give them agency to choose what they want to do. On the other hand, we have to also sometimes guide them toward the right equipment for what they need. So when we spoke about that sandwich and we said, Kim just wants you know, pickles, she doesn't want any tuna. Um, and all she wanted to do, let's say, was sit in the calming, um, calming cozy canoe. But what she really needed was to get some action because she's under aroused in class, then we have to guard her towards things like a trampoline. But I would give her choices because remember, we don't wanna impose anything. <clears throat> so if she likes the cozy canoe, think about what's the most like that that can give her active input. And I just thought of something, a cozy canoe, if you rock it from side to side, can give you that input that you're looking for, that vestibular input. So yes, you have to guide the kids but you can't impose something on them. You give them choices. Okay. What do you do when students gravitate to one area of a sensory room or a sensory corner and everybody wants to use those products? Okay. So in a sensory room, the best way to handle that would be to have that obstacle course that everybody's going through the stations at different times. And that would, and you give them like a transition warning. Okay, in, you know, 10 seconds, we're going to move to the next, everybody move to the next station. And that really gets kids rotating through a room. Now, you also mentioned that, let's say you have sensory equipment in the classroom and everybody wants to use that equipment. So let's say with our break box, we have um, certain tools, but everybody wants the body stock. You can buy individual body stocks, a few of them, but also, you tell the kids, oh, you know what? Evan's using the body stock now. His turns over in five minutes. And in five minutes, you'll get the body stock. Or you can have a rotation like with little Velcros. Oh, this person is using it, then that person, then that student gets to use it. So this way they all learn that they get their sensory needs met. They might not be right away, but they will get them met. Okay. Next question is one of our favorite questions. I get this all the time. <laughs> How do I make sure that the sensory room or the classroom corner does not become a playroom? Okay, so I would first recommend getting the whole class together and letting them try out the tools, right? And you can note which tools, you know, a certain kid likes better than the others. Then after everybody is already familiar with the tools, there can be a schedule or a pass, just the way you have a bathroom pass, a pass to the sensory room. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the sensory corner. Oh, look, the sensory corner is full right now. There are two children with passes. Okay, you're gonna have to wait a few minutes for your turn. Um, and there are going to be kids that you will realize will need the sensory corner. And the children that don't eventually will taper off. They're like need to go to the sensory corner just because it's a novel thing. That's not to say that if they, you know, finish their worksheets or whatever it is, they can't also go to the sensory corner, but children will eventually gravitate to the sensory corner, only the ones that need it. And the other ones, it'll be like a once in a while thing. Okay. Okay. One last question here and a nod to those of you who are building out your sensory spaces now. 
how do you as an admin choose the right products for my students when building out a sensory space? Okay, so first you're going to have to go into your sensory room for a few sessions with different classes as an observer. And you're going to see which of that equipment is really not being used and maybe needs to be used in a different way or replaced. And what are the things that are constantly being used and maybe need another one of? Okay, so first comes observation. Then you're going to see to make sure that your sensory room has equipment both for calming and for alerting. And you're going to make your purchases based on that knowledge. Now, the way that you can kind of um, look at the sensory room with a better lens, let's say your detective lens and see which kids need which stuff is to get more educated on sensory processing. Okay, and that could be done in many different ways. We have a wonderful sensory coach series on our website that can really help educate you as to what sensory tools need to be used. Okay, thank you, Rifki. We're gonna field a few more questions later. In the meantime, I'm gonna hand it back to Rifki to discuss data collection and progress tracking. Back to you, Rifki. Okay, here we go. Okay, so in order to increase your success, we just spoke about observing students because of the equipment. You need information about a specific student. So you have to observe that student and collect data. Okay, now, for example, let's say the child is using sensory room equipment, he's going regularly to the sensory room, but is still not ready to focus in class, right? So what could be the issue there? One answer is that you need to redirect the student to sensory equipment that will be most effective for them. And we mentioned that in one of the questions, right? We need to co-regulate our students before they can really regulate themselves. So we have to be their guides. It's not one size fits all. And the data collection will help you identify what each student needs. Let's see how that looks. Hey, I'd like to share with you some data collection we did on a student called Ashley. This is an actual student that we had. What was happening with Ashley? She was in a six to one to one classroom and she was constantly biting herself and hitting herself on the head whenever she felt overwhelmed. Now the teacher was like, she did not know what this was about, but it was happening mostly during circle time. And during circle time one day, she asked her assistant to run circle time and she stood back and she observed. What did she see? Every time one of the children got excited because his name was called, he would let out this high pitched squeal or when his favorite song was being played, right? And that's when she would start with this and biting herself. So the teacher intuited that these high pitched squeals are what is setting Ashley off, okay? Now, based on this data, so we have over here, we have our student Ashley, look at the top under the orange, and we marked what her behavior was and we want her to use her body safely. It was not safe what she was doing, right? And this was happening mostly during circle time, but the teacher took a baseline of her data, how many times this was happening per day. Now it didn't have to be that only the teacher was taking the data, but somebody was assigned to mark down when Ashley was doing this. So we can know how much she was doing it and see if our intervention worked, right? So. I am happy to report that with the use of sense um, noise blocking headphones and a chewy, Ashley's behavior decreased by an average of 50%. Okay, now that is a significant drop, but with the calculation sheet that we have with this data sheet, you're going to be looking for a 20% drop, drop in the behavior, a 20% improvement. Anything below 20% is going to flag that you need to use a different tool. But if you have 20%, you can like celebrate because that has already changed the day for a child. Now let's look at another sheet that you can use to really hone in on what kind of input a child would need. So over here, we have Ashley again, we used her as our sample and the teacher tried out different things. She thought maybe if Ashley's hands were busy, she wouldn't bite herself. So she tried to fidget. Well, that really did not work for Ashley. She thought maybe some sensory brushing would calm her. And she tried that too. Ashley loved it, but it wasn't what was keeping her calm long-term. So the teacher was able to understand 
that the noise canceling headphones worn during circle time and free play, which were the noisiest parts of the day were helpful. And that Ashley was using her jaw muscles, which are the strongest muscles in the body for their size to give herself deep pressure input through her mouth to regulate. And it also kept her from biting herself. All right, so I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Keyes, who is going to let us know how his sensory room is helping focus and self-regulate with the children and pre and disruptive behavior and support inclusion in his classrooms. Our discipline, uh, our infractions have gone down. The students in the life skills program are not as aggressive, and even the kids in the AB program, uh, they're not uh, more prone to uh, to have arguments or disagreements. And if they come down here, they can kind of relax because we, we also can uh, can uh, adjust the lighting, and so that has an mm -hmm. effect on them too. And so we can dim the lights down. They can have the music on. The interactive smart board is on, and so. They really come down here and calm themselves down. And the teachers buy into it also because they want to come down here and see the kids benefit because a lot of times those kids are anxious in the classroom. And so when they come down here, all that anxiety is kind of extinguished. And everyone's calm and everyone can focus on learning. And that's the, that's the goal, to get everybody focused on learning because if you got a chaotic class, no one's learning anything, you know, at least during that chaos. Once the chaos has settled down, then you go back to teaching and learning. Amazing. Okay, so these are the key takeaways from our sensory room presentation today. Okay, we learned how to set up schedules and routines. We implemented best practices for safety. We learned how your tools can be very versatile and used anywhere. And we had these data sheets to track the behavior and effectiveness of your interventions. Okay, Elisheva. We can pause now for some final questions. Thank you, Rifki. So we have a couple of questions that came in. How many days do you recommend tracking data for? Okay, at least five. You can do it for a little bit more. If you're, um, you'd wanna do that if your behavior is less obvious. With Ashley, it was like happening all the time but five to 10 days max, because after that amount of time, you're gonna really wanna try your intervention. Okay, for the behavior tracking form, what kind of oversight is necessary? Should the OT approve the sensory tools or just make recommendations for the teacher? So the o it depends also on the availability of your OT. Okay, so if you have a child with an IEP that has specific sensory um, information in his IEP, that will guide you. But for a child who just needs sensory input and it's not so clear, you have to be the sensory detective and see what kind of input that child needs. So remember our um, go-to for sensory overwhelm is always that deep pressure input, and that could be given in many ways. Um, and for arousal, it's that vestibular input, that bouncing or that um, more active sensory input. Did okay. that answer the question? <laughs> yes, I believe it did. Thank you, Ricky. Okay. I love the concept outlined in the sensory interve intervention tracking form. How do teachers know what tools to start with? So it's a little similar to the previous question, but adds on a little more, Rifki. Okay, very good. So as I mentioned, um, sensory processing is something that everybody should be very well versed in. And there are a lot of resources av available on YouTube or from different sources that can help you get more of an understanding of sensory processing. So it's imperative that if you have an education day, a staff education day, that you bring that to your school and just help teachers and parents understand what the principles of sensory processing are and how to use them. When I was training our staff in, you know, why do we sell sensory equipment? We had a day where everybody tried on a sensory deficit. I had somebody putting pegboards, pegs in a pegboard with gloves on. I had somebody trying to read the Gettysburg Address while somebody crinkled a potato chip bag in her ear. And you can get a sense of what a child is going through. And I think that's very important to understand that. And then you'll be able to pick sensory interventions that will be able to address their issues. Thank you, Rifki. Okay, before we wrap up, and Aviva tells you about your surprise gift, 
we want to announce the winner of our live training package. When each of you registered for our webinar, you were automatically entered to win. And I'm really delighted to announce that the winner is Southampton School District in New York. We'll be in touch with you after the webinar to share the details. And now I'd like to turn this over to Aviva Weiss, who will conclude today's webinar and highlight what to expect next. Aviva? Thank you, Elisheva. Thank you, Rifki, for your great presentation and answers to so many excellent questions. And we want to thank all of you for joining us today. To help, to help you take your sensory room up to the next level, we have a surprise gift for you and your school, and the details will be sent to you by email. If you have any questions or other challenges, we're here to help. Please contact your account manager at Fun and Function or email Active mind at funandfunction.com. Before we end the conference, please tell us how we did today. Please click the link in the chat and answer one question. It's that easy and it's super helpful to us. Thank you for sharing your feedback. We are always here for you and your community. We are so grateful for your presence and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. And if you want to put your key takeaway from the sensory room webinar in the chat, we'd like to know what your key takeaway, what did you come out with that was most important from this webinar today? Sandwich technique, schedule board, excellent. Data tracking, data sheets, wonderful, everything, thank you. Choice boards, yes, important. Sandwich, data, sandwich. The passes, great. The sandwich technique, okay. Thank you, sandwich technique. It's something that I heard from somebody else, so I'm going to uh, you know, give them some of the credit. The do's and don'ts, wonderful. Managing a hybrid space. The passes, again. Equipment variety, okay, thank you. You worked hard on that one. Wonderful. I'm so glad all of you had such a positive experience. Thank you so much for all your input.